Hallelujah. He is wonderful. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us on a Wednesday night. And uh, I, I am uh, uh, have a full heart tonight. I spent some time praying before church for the youth service and then for the kids service. And then finally I prayed that whatever the Lord had left over, he'd just sort of dump it out on us up here. Tonight it begins a three-week series that uh, our assistant pastor, Brother Colton Harrington, is going to be teaching. He did this three or four, I think four years ago, uh, four years and two sanctuaries ago uh, on Blue Ridge and it was tremendous and uh, it really helped kind of restructure the way I thought about prayer and the Bible says that the Old Testament tabernacle and the law were given to us as in samples and examples, illustrations and so I'm excited for what's going to happen tonight and over the next two Wednesdays as he comes right now can we just pray together like we always do for God's anointing to rest on him and Lord help me to be a hearer and a doer tonight I want to get what you'd have to say and leave here more like you than I am right now in Jesus I agree with Brother Bell I am glad to be here tonight I don't just come to church on Wednesdays because it's what I do I come to church because I know there's an almighty God and I can get into His presence. I can get before His throne and my life can be changed. I was thinking about how, you know, this world, we, us as, a, as mankind, uh, we're always wondering what's after this life or what's out there. What's, we're searching for something that's bigger than ourselves. And, and that search has sent us to the far reaches of space. And, uh, to distant planets and the moon and and uh, whatever you believe about that, if we win or not, that's another story for another time. But uh, yeah, we, we search as far and wide as we can to try to find what is the meaning of life, what is out there. And, and I know it would just it would just boggle the minds of some of these people and scientists out there if they knew that the secrets of the universe weren't in the far farthest reaches of space, but were most likely a 15 to 20 minute car drive down the road where they could find an apostolic church preaching and teaching the true word of God and they could step into a place like this on a Wednesday or a Sunday and feel what you and I feel in this house. I don't know if you've realized it, but there's an almighty God that's here tonight. We are in his presence and he is here because he loves us. And I don't know about you, but I am so thankful for that. I, I am glad when they were singing uh, about the blood and I, I thought about what God has done for me, done for this church, and we truly are a blessed people to be here tonight. And uh, this, what we're, what we're doing over the next few weeks is the purpose of, of what we're doing is exactly what you and I feel right here, right now. It's to take us from something that's normal and mundane into a, a presence of an almighty God, into an atmosphere where our faith rises and we truly believe that our prayer is going to do something great. That's the whole purpose is to get us to where we are right now, what we feel in this place. Amen. I'm glad that, that God started out this series with, with this presence tonight. I don't know if you feel it, but the, the presence of God is in this place tonight. I'm excited to see what he's going to do here for the youth, for the kids. What a blessing it is to just step into the presence of an almighty God. He has been good to us, hasn't he? We are going to be uh, reading quite a bit of scripture tonight. If, uh, if you would stand with me just a little bit longer, I want to read one scripture, and then I promise you can sit down. Luke 11 and 1 says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. If you would, one more time, can you just lift your hands with me before you're seated? And can we ask God to truly speak to us? God, give me a hunger for prayer. God, not, not just what somebody's telling me that I should feel or should do, but but God put it down in my heart, a desire to know you, to walk with you, to be close with you, God, to be in your presence every day. 
in Jesus' holy, mighty name. You can be seated. The disciples came to Jesus and asked him to teach them to pray. Prayer is something, if you're going to be effective at it, anybody can pick up a Bible and, and learn some prayers and learn about prayer and, and come up with some prayer on their own. Anybody can hear somebody else praying and pick up a few pointers along the way. But if you're truly going to be effective at prayer, the disciples realize that we need somebody to teach us. And I'm not here to say I'm the guy to teach you to pray, but what I am saying is that at some point in our lives, prayer needs to be taught to us how to do it effectively. Maybe that for you comes from directly from the Bible. Maybe you hear a lesson taught that sparks something uh, in, in your faith and, and changes your prayer life, however that may be. Uh, Jesus, his reply to the disciples was uh, a prayer that uh, so many uh, pray today, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, and it goes on. And, and what Jesus was teaching them was not say as I'm saying, follow these words to the T and, every, and this is what you need to pray. He was teaching them a pattern to pray after. And, and that is the same for you and I today. Um, we, we learned two things from Luke 11 and 1. Prayer is something that is taught. In prayer, uh, when it's effective, it has a pattern to it that's uh, repeatable. Okay. Uh, now, I'm not trying to convince anybody here tonight to pray the tabernacle prayer. It's what I pray in my daily prayer, and I do personally think it's the best pattern of prayer that's out there, but there are others. Uh, but what I'm trying to accomplish in this three-week series on the tabernacle prayer is to help you and I think outside of the box, to help us step out of our normal uh, acceptance of our prayer life and to begin to ask the question, is there a better way for me to be praying? Can I do what I'm doing more effectively? Is there a certain process or a pattern that's available that I could follow after and really have a stronger, more effective prayer life? Now, I realize that uh, prayer is not something that should be ap approached haphazardly or casually, uh, but effective prayer is something that must have structure. Processes and patterns must be in place. For anything that you do that's long-term in your life, anything that you're going to try and repeat daily or weekly, monthly, yearly, certainly uh, for the rest of your life, uh, at some point along the way, you're going to develop certain routines and habits, uh, uh, processes that help you become effective at whatever that may be. Whether it's your job, learning how to be a parent, uh, there are certain things that are just going to happen along the way that are going to help you do better as the days go by. And prayer should be no different. Every day our prayer life is one that's meant to get a little bit better, a little bit more effective, uh, reach the throne room of God maybe a little bit easier for us day after day. Um, <clears throat> the tabernacle prayer uh, and any pattern of prayer is one that can help you avoid a few things that uh, seem to be great pitfalls when people go into prayer. And the first is that you, we run out of things to say sometimes. Has anybody ever been there where you just ran out of things to say? You thought you were praying for an hour and you look up and maybe two minutes has passed by on the clock and you say, I prayed for everybody, their brother and their dog, and I don't have anything left to say. Or maybe you find yourself repeating over and over, Jesus, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I want to tell you there is a greater depth to prayer than that. Or maybe you forget what you want to pray for. You know, you have things that maybe come to your mind throughout the day, and by the time you get to your place of prayer, you know, the days went by and chaos has happened and the kids were wild, and, and you find you get down and you, and you pray, 
pray, and then you, you go on about your way, and you lay your head on your pillow at night, and you realize, oh, I forgot to pray about brother and sister so-and-so, or about this need, or whatever it may be. Well, if you have a process in place, uh, in a pattern, it helps you to avoid these common pitfalls in prayer. Now, the prayer that I'm going to be talking about over these next few uh, weeks is not the type of prayer where, you know, you're just going about your day and you suddenly feel a call to prayer. Well, that's not really the time to go into a pattern of prayer. Or if you're about to drive over the edge of the cliff and you're crying out for God to save you, that's really not the time, you know, to, to, to break down the tabernacle prayer. But the prayer that I'm talking about is that everyday routine prayer that you and I are supposed to have as a part uh, of our daily lives of just being a Christian. You know, when we steal away and we find that place of prayer, whether it's in your closet or, or where, wherever it is, and, and you're about to, you know, try to touch the throne of God and bring all of those needs that you routinely pray for to God. That's the time of prayer that we're going to be talking about. Now, uh, I think Brother Blake has a, an image for me, if all that worked out. Let's look at the other one. <coughs> Give it time. Was there another one? Should have been two on there. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Now, this is something I did not draw myself because I have no artistic ability. Uh, but this is a basic layout of the tabernacle. And I wanted to show this because I'm sure everybody in here is not familiar with uh, the layout of the tabernacle. It's probably not something you sit down and study every day, right? Uh, but if you'll notice, uh, at the very front here, there is a red curtain. Uh, now, this is the gate that the priests and the people would use to go into the courtyard of the tabernacle. And when you get into the courtyard, the first piece that you see there is the altar. And after the altar, uh, behind that, there is a little laver there where the priest would wash himself. And if you look beyond that... There is the, the tabernacle itself that's made up of the holy place. And if you can see from where you are, uh, two-thirds of the way back, um, there is a curtain that's kind of opened up so you can see into that room there. But that is the holy of holies. There was a veil separating these two rooms. Uh, but if, if you go back to the very first entrance into the holy place, you'll see there are five pillars there. Keep that in mind there. Uh, but once you go into the holy place, um, you'll see a few pieces of furniture. Now, on the far left, I know it's probably hard to see because it's small, uh, but you could, if, if you had any desire to, you could go home and Google this tonight and find a million pictures. Uh, but there is a golden candlestick, and then there is a little table there that's called the table of showbread. And then there is, uh, in the front there, that is the altar of incense, and if you were to go from the holy place into the most holy place in the back uh, third of that uh, tabernacle there, uh, there's a curtain there, and you can't tell from this picture, but there are four pillars. And there is a, that curtain there, uh, in reality, was about a hand breadth thick. And uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation as, as to how people would go from the holy place to the most holy. That's not why we're here today, but it is interesting. Uh, but once you get into the most holy place, you'll see that there is the Ark of the Covenant. And if you were to, uh, on, of course, on top of the Ark is the mercy seat. And if you were to pull off that mercy seat uh, before the Philistines captured the Ark, uh, you would have found in there uh, Aaron's rod that budded, a pot of manna, and you would have found the tables of stone that Moses brought down from the mount. Okay, so now... Remember all of those pieces because they're going to be important as we go through this uh, tabernacle prayer. So um, let me let me see here. Okay, so what what we're going to uh, discuss it, this is it's a very exhaustive outline of prayer. It covers everything that you could want to pray, and at times it may seem very detailed. Uh, but just know that prayer is something that is very detailed. And the more detailed you learn it, the easier it is to pray it and remember it. 
Now, I'm going to go through a whole lot, and uh, some, of what, uh, some of what I pray may seem to be a strange way to phrase something or to pray for a certain thing, uh, but just know that there's probably a scripture behind it. And all of what I'm speaking comes right out of Scripture today. I have so much Scripture, I'm not going to bore all of y'all with that. Uh, we'll be here for weeks and weeks and weeks. If you have any desire, I can give you all of my notes as every Scripture reference at the end of uh, everything that I pray. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but, w- but what I'm doing here is, is, is two things. Number one is I'm going to teach through the tabernacle prayer. But at the same time, because it's almost impossible to just teach it, uh, I'm going to somewhat uh, pray it as we go, okay? So it it may seem a little uh, different as well, because I'll be teaching it, and I'll be showing you how to pray through it. Now, when we're done, you may say that was such a waste of time. I I don't want to incorporate anything from that into my prayer life. Maybe you will find one little thing that can really help you in your day-to-day prayer life. Or maybe you like the majority of this. Uh, but, but really, ultimately, the goal of this is to help you think more purposefully and to be more intentional in your daily talks with God. So with that said, let's turn to Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. And I do have a few scripture that I'm going to read, uh, but most of it will just be uh, in my footnotes that you'll never see. It says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Hebrews chapter 8. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So when you read that, it tells us that this tabernacle that you and I are looking at, that the Jews Uh, made all those thousands of years ago is not the original tabernacle. But there is a tabernacle that the Lord pitched that's in heaven that man had nothing to do with. And the tabernacle of Moses was patterned after that true tabernacle. Okay? So what you and I are doing is not just after patterned after something that's man-made. But it's after something that God himself put together and assembled. And he thought it was so good that he gave the pattern to Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness. So that says a lot about this pattern that we're looking at. Now, Anthony Mangan said that there are over 40 verses in the Bible on creation and over 400 concerning the tabernacle. There are two chapters about creation and five books concerning the tabernacle and redemption. And Brother Mangan's dad, G.A. Mangan, prayed through the tabernacle every day for over 60 years. The first time I ever heard of this uh, was from Anthony Mangan preaching and uh, talking about his dad praying through it every day. And at that time, I had no idea what it was. Uh, But as the years went by, I looked into it uh, and saw all of this. And it's something that I have prayed for several years several years. Uh, But as we saw in the picture up there, if we're going to pray 
through the tabernacle, the first thing that you and I have to do is get into the tabernacle. And that starts with us going through that gate and entering into the courtyard. The tabernacle was enclosed by a wall. There was one door that was uh, on the eastern side where the priest could enter the outer court. And this is where the priest's ministry in the tabernacle began. And this is where you and I began as we pray our way through the tabernacle. The word Levi, you know, the, the Levites were the priests. They, they were from the tribe of Levi. The word Levi means to join. And through their service in the tabernacle, the priest would join the people to God. The tabernacle is also called the tent of meeting because it was the meeting place for God and man. And the Bible calls you and I a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Uh, as those Old Testament priests ministered, uh, you and I, as the children of God today, are priests and priestesses. And uh, as priests, we make our way through the tabernacle, uh, joining people to God through our prayer and supplication. That's the purpose. Psalms 100, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. Thanksgiving means the extension of hands, uh, adoration, a choir of worshipers, uh, confession, a sacrifice of praise. It means simply to give thanks or to give offering. The word praise there means laudation, as if you were singing somebody's praise, and specifically it means to sing a hymn. So just as you and I began this service with prayer, and we began with lifting our hands and singing and magnifying God and talking about His goodness and exalting Him, worshiping Him, that's the thought that's behind uh, Psalms 100 here where it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So there is a certain way that you and I are supposed to go into the tabernacle. These are things <clears throat> that are typical in a church service. We do these things because we know there is a certain way to approach God when you desire to come into his presence. And that is why David, the Bible says he sacrificed, he danced, and he praised God before the ark. There is a right way to enter into the presence of God. There is a right way to enter into the presence of a king. If you were to ever approach a king, you couldn't just run up to them at any time that you wanted to. Number one, the time had to be appointed. Number two, if you were going to go see a king, especially in David's days, uh, you would have to bring some kind of gift to the king, a gift that was a sacrifice to you. It had to mean something to you. That's why David said, I will not give to God what has cost me nothing. So when you and I come into the presence of God, uh, the first thing that we do is we bring a sacrifice gift, a sacrifice, sacrifice of praise to him, and we begin to lift up and magnify the name of Jesus. And when I do this, I, I, I first I, I go in and I, I thank God for waking me up that day. I thank God for allowing me to see another day. I thank Him for the health of my family. I thank Him for all of His blessings, His goodness. Psalm 118 says, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And I thank God for His benefits towards me every day. For what He's already done, for what He's doing right now, and for what I know He's getting ready to do for me and for my family for the church, for the kingdom in the future. The psalmist said, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. And I, I stop and I thank God for, for His mercy, for His grace, for His loving kindness, for His compassions that are new every morning, the Bible says. For the writer recorded that the Lord, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassion fails not. They are new every morning, He said. Great is thy faithfulness. And you can stop here and you can take as much time as you feel like you need to. But the purpose is that we're just going to lift up God. We're going to give Him thanks for all that is done. We're going to magnify His name. We're going to thank Him for this day. We're going to thank Him for His grace. We're going to take a little bit of time and, and thank Him for His goodness. Because of His mercies, we're not consumed. And we can even be in here today lifting up our hands and coming boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. 
And as you make your way into the courtyard with praise, uh, uh, and you make your way to that first piece of furniture there, it's called the altar of sacrifice. Exodus 27 and 1 says, And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. Upon entering the courtyard, the priest would come to this altar of sacrifice. Here he would perform the sacrifices to atone for sin. He couldn't go any further into the tabernacle until he had made a sacrifice. He had to take that animal and tie it to the horns of the altar. He had to kill that animal and set that animal on fire and burn it until it was completely consumed by the flame. Now that word altar literally means to slaughter, to kill, or to offer. There was nothing pretty about the altar. It was a place of death, a place that smelled of burning flesh, and blood covered everything, including the priest that was offering the sacrifice. But here at the altar, flesh had to die. Before the priest was allowed to continue through the tabernacle, the sin had to be dealt with. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there is no remission of sin. And if he was, his sin was going to be covered and he was going to be able to move forward into the presence of God, uh, blood had to be shed to cover that sin. Now, before you and I can move any further in our prayer, we have to deal with the flesh. We have to put our flesh on the altar till it's completely consumed by the flames so that our spiritual man can live. Paul said, in my flesh dwells no good thing. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Our flesh, this natural and this carnal man, uh, it only serves sin. The Bible tells us in Romans 7, remember the whole goal of what you and I are doing is to step out of the natural and into a supernatural encounter with God. But we all have a sin problem, and it must be dealt with at the altar through repentance. John 9 and 31, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man will be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Now, what the Scripture isn't saying, uh, it's not saying that, that if you cry out to God that He won't hear you. But, but what it's saying is that if, if you want to develop a prayer life and you want a close walk in relationship with God where you know each other intimately, then there's a sin in your life that has to be dealt with. Because God doesn't hear sinners. Or in another word, He doesn't have a close walk and relationship with sinners. Because there's a barrier of sin there that's separating uh, the two of you. And of course, you can cry out at any time. It, you know, if you, if you get in a bad spot and you, and you cry out to God, He's going to hear your prayer. But you will never have that closeness until you deal with the sin. And that's what happens here at the altar. It was the biggest piece, piece of furniture that was in the tabernacle. All the other pieces could fit inside of the altar. The altar must be the biggest part of your prayer. It doesn't necessarily have to take the longest, but it's got to be the focus of your prayer. A transformation from flesh to spirit is taking place at the altar. Uh, the altar is the heart of the tabernacle, and that's why it's the first piece that you come to and the biggest. Everything that happens in that tabernacle journey hinges on what happens at the altar. God told Moses not to have any steps leading up to the altar. There are no steps to repentance. You just come, it's just you coming to God and dealing with the sin issue. Pouring your heart out, exposing every part of yourself to God, and asking for forgiveness. This isn't where you take time and you pray for your family or for your job or your finances. This is strictly where you deal with flesh. It's, it's where every secret sin, every struggle comes to light. And anything in your life that is causing separation between you and God must be dealt with at this spot. 
Now when I come to the altar, I pray and I just ask God to forgive me for my sins. God, wash me in your blood as white as snow, as the writer said. Bury that old man that I was and raise me up a new creature in Christ. Paul said in Romans, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul said that if you're going to do the perfect will of God, that there are two things that you have to deal with. You've got to deal with the mind, and you've got to deal with the flesh. And here I ask God to forgive me of every thought that's unholy, that's unrighteous, that's wicked, that's, that's lustful, envious, that's, that's bitter, that's hateful, that's proud. Any thoughts that I've entertained that are enmity with God, that keep me separated from Him. I say, God, please purge my conscience. Remove anything that doesn't please You. Search me, O God, as the writer said, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and purge me. Uh, with hyssop and lead me in the way everlasting. Renew me in the spirit of my mind. Help me guard and protect my mind. Help me to not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. All of those things that I just said come straight out of Scripture. Unblind my mind from any deception. Help me to see the truth in all things. Help me to have the mind of Christ. Help me to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And whatsoever things are true and honest, just and lovely, pure of a good report, virtuous and praiseworthy, help me, God, to think on these things things. And once we have dealt with the mind, then we deal with the body, the flesh, and ask God to forgive me for every corrupt and evil communication. Forgive me for what I've set before my eyes. Forgive me for what I've allowed into my ears, for every hurtful thing that I've spoken. Forgive me for what I've allowed into my heart, any anger or bitterness or pride or, or anything there that is keeping me uh, uh, have from 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 getting in close relationship with God that's keeping me separate. Uh, create in me a clean heart, God, I pray, and renew a right spirit within me. Forgive me for the works of my hands that I've done that are unpleasing, the places that I have allowed my feet to take me that's caused me to walk out of your way and sin against you. Help me to take this flesh to the altar, I pray, and, and just place it in the flames until it's completely consumed so that my spiritual man can live and help me to die daily. Help me to crucify this flesh with the affections and the lusts. Help me to deny myself daily and to take up my cross and follow after you. Help me to present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, which is my reasonable service. Help me to count the things of this world as loss, if I might but win you. All of those things come directly from Scripture. And you can stay at the altar for as long or as short as you need. If it's not a place that you spend much time at, in the beginning it's probably going to take you a little while. But the more time you spend there, you'll see that the less time you need to spend there. Not that you won't have sin, but those things in your life that have constantly plagued you. When you form a habit and a routine of bringing them to God and, and, and laying them down on the altar and, and putting them in the flame until they're consumed, uh, eventually you just start to get power over those things and they begin to fall to the side and, and you really do begin to change. Uh, uh, but you can stay there for as long as you need to. But remember that what you don't put on the altar, you allow to live. And if you want bitterness and malice, envy, hatred, wickedness, these things to live in you, then simply don't put them on the altar, but continue to carry them with you. But you cannot walk in the Spirit until you have crucified the flesh. I'm trying to move quickly here for sake of time. The next piece of uh, furniture that you would come to would be that laver of brass. Once you leave the altar, uh, the writer said in Exodus chapter 30, speaking of this laver, uh, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash 
withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. And he made the laver of brass and the foot of brass of the looking glasses or the mirrors of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So after the sacrifice was complete, that blood-stained and dirty priest would go to the laver, and there he would wash himself. And the blood and the filth from the altar that represented all of that sin, uh, if the priest tried to go into the holy place with, with all of that reminder of the sin and the sacrifice and that corruption, the Bible says that he would be instantly killed. But he had to go to that laver and wash all of that off. And uh, Paul said about the church uh, that he might sanctify it in Ephesians and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. John 17 and 17, he said, Sanctify them uh, through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. So you and I don't have a laver of brass here physically today to wash ourselves. But what we do have is the Word of God that sanctifies us. It cleanses us. And just as water does, it begins to wash us and make us clean, starting from the inside out. We're washed, we're cleansed by the Word of God. After we have left the altar and we've dealt with the flesh and all of its hang-ups and sins, we must finish the process by being washed and cleansed by the Word of God. As those priests looked into that laver made from the mirrors of those women, they could see the reflection. The same goes for you and I today when we look into the Word of God. The Word is meant to expose me. It's meant to show my worst so that I can deal with it. The Bible says, uh, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word is meant to literally cut sin out of your life. The priest could see his reflection in that laver of brass until the very moment that he would put his hands into that water. And instantly the blood on his hands would begin to mingle with that water and all that he would be able to see after that was the blood. And you and I uh, are meant to, to, to put our, when we see our reflection, we're meant to put our hands into that word until that view of ourselves becomes distorted and it's no longer us that we're looking at, but we're looking at a reflection of Jesus Christ. Until all that you and I see is the blood that has washed us white as snow. And James said, For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So as I look into the word, it's a perfect law of liberty and I can see myself in that reflection uh, as a man that beholds his natural self in a mirror the Bible says but what I pray is God when I leave your word when I close the pages of this book and I go my way about my day don't let me be the same way as when I opened your word but God help me to not forget what manner of man I was but help me God to let your word wash over me help me to allow what I have read to get down into my my heart and into my spirit and to allow it to begin to work and change me. Help me to receive out of your word everything that I need today so that I can be changed, whether it's doctrine, reproof, correction, or instruction in righteousness. And everything that the word does can be summed up in those four things. It's either doctrine, reproof, correction, or instruction in righteousness. Uh, Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good 
works. Notice these are things that bring conflict into our lives. The Word isn't something that's meant to comfort me and to lull me to sleep. It's meant to be a comfort, but it is a comfort through conflict. Uh, it's called a sword, and it divides. It cuts away the things that don't belong there. And it's only when I get those things out of my life that it does become a comfort and a relief. It exposes me, and it does a positive work by removing the negative that's in me. So that the man, the woman of God, may be perfect and truly furnished. This means mature, fully equipped, accomplished, and complete. Now pray, God, give me a good heart to receive your word into. Help me to break up that fallow ground so that your seed can find a heart of good ground to be sown into. And help me to bring forth fruit a hundredfold. I pray God, give me perfect understanding of your word, just as Luke said he had. Give me perfect understanding of your word. Write it on the tables of my heart. Quicken it to my mind and help me to be able to call upon it when I need it. And then it's a good place right here to just stop open your Bible, and maybe read a few passages of Scripture, specifically some that maybe deal with the conflict that we face in the flesh. Psalms 51 is a good one of that where David uh, found a place of repentance. Romans 7 and 8 where Paul is writing about the flesh. Galatians 5 that talks about the works of the flesh. And after this priest had uh, made the sacrifice and after he had washed in that labor and he was getting ready to go into the Holy of Holies. Uh, at some point, uh, he would change garments here. When the high priest entered the holy place to minister, uh, the Bible tells us in Exodus 29 that he had to be wearing the garments of the high priest or he would be killed. Now this uh, was uh, when he was planning to go into the Holy of Holies because there were priests in and out of the holy place, that first room, every day. But only one time a year could a priest go into the Holy of Holies. And uh, that, on, on that day, the priest, when he went in, he had to be wearing that breast, the breastplate, that ephod, the robe, the, the coat, the miter, that, that girdle, and those linen breeches that we read about in Scripture. He was entering into the presence and the glory of God. And he was about to go and represent man to God. All the needs of the people and all the needs of Israel were about to be brought uh, to God by that high priest. And when you and I make our way into the presence of God, we also are representing man to God. First, ourselves and our family, our friends, and uh, by extension, the world that we pray for, the, the lost, the saved, whoever it may be. And before we do that, we have to take off that old garment and begin to put on the, that priestly apparel. The writer in Jude says, and others save with fear, pulling them out of fire, hating even the garment that is spotted by the flesh. Jude tells us that while we were in sin, the garment that we once wore was corrupted and was made filthy from the flesh. Once we have died out to self and we've been washed by the Word, then we must take off that old garment and put on the new garment. Romans 13, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So once we have cast off that old spotted garment of the flesh, we should put on the garment of Christ. And I, uh, the way that I, I stop and I pray this is, uh, I say, God, I, I pray with things that have to do with the changing of garments. And the Bible has a lot to say about that. I say, God, please take from me the spirit of heaviness and give me the garment of praise. Uh, Peter said, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. I pray God, clothe me with humility. Help me to not think more highly of myself than I ought than I ought to. Isaiah said, uh, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. Now pray God, help me to put on the garment of salvation. Help me to walk in a way that displays truth to the world. Help me to walk in a way that I'm living up to the truth, so that I'm living up to this salvation. And as a royal priest, as the Bible says, as an ambassador of Christ, a living epistle known and 
and read of all men. Help me to put on Christ and to walk in the Spirit. Help me to represent you well to this lost and dying world. And at the border of the ephod was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all the way around the garment. And that bell is a reminder of the gifts of the Spirit. For when those on the outside heard the bells uh, from inside the holy place where the priest was ministering, they knew, number one, that he wasn't dead. Number two, uh, that he was going about his work in the temple. So those bells represent the gifts or the workings of the Spirit. And that pomegranate is a reminder uh, to us of the fruit of the Spirit. And I pray that the fruit of the Spirit will be manifest in my life. I pray that everything that I do will be done under the influence of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And I pray that my character, my words, my actions uh, will be uh, influenced by the Spirit. And I pray that I will bear the fruit of the Spirit so that others can see it and partake of it as a person would natural fruit, fruit and be blessed in their own life. And I pray that the gifts of the Spirit will be manifest in me. I pray for my life. I pray for my family, for the church that I'm a part of, for this lost world. I say, God, help me to be a vessel that's fit for your kingdom. Help me to be a conduit that you can flow through. Help me to be something that's sanctified, that, 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 that you can work in and, and work through to see your kingdom furthered in this earth. Now, if you would stand. I know we went a little long uh, tonight. Uh, hopefully the next two lessons won't be that long. The introduction always takes the longest, right? But the tabernacle prayer is something that is so great. Whether you decide to do it or not, I believe everybody here could take something from it. If nothing else, just realize that maybe there's a way to think differently about prayer than I've thought my whole life. Maybe there's really some processes, some, some patterns that I can incorporate that can help me not forget what I'm wanting to pray for, that it can help me not get down there and run out of things to say in two minutes, uh, that, and that can just change my prayer life and help me to get into the, uh, the presence of God at the end of my prayer. That's the goal. I wonder, can we just for a few minutes, you can come down, these altars are open if you want to pray or pray at your seat. Can we just take a moment and talk to God and say, God, help me to get a hunger for prayer. Help me, God, to have a desire to pray and to be in your presence. God, help me to see my great need for you, my great need to seek after you every day. Help me to realize, God, that I can't do this on my own, that I need you, that I need your spirit, that I need that altar in my life, that I need that labor to wash me, that I need those new garments to put on and that new life to live and that new way to walk. And Oh, God, help me to fall in love with your word. Help me to fall in love with your presence, God. When Whenever I have a problem, help me to go first to you with it and to seek you early and often in all the days of my life. God, help me to fall in love with prayer greater than I ever have. God, help me to believe in prayer that it works, that it does what your word says it does, what my pastor says it does, what my friends and family say it does. God, help me to see how real and powerful a relationship with you can be in Jesus mighty name let's just take a moment and lift our hearts and hands to it